Thank you for that rousing, <laughs> that rousing Greenbelt welcome. Uh, it's, always, uh, it's always a pleasure uh, to, to be at Greenbelt. It's my sixth Greenbelt uh, this year, and, and, and God willing, there'll be, there'll be many, many more. There's a specter rising over Britain today. Sounds like the beginning of a manifesto that some of you may recall. Or at least someone, some people would like us to think there's a specter rising over Britain today. Muslims demand Sharia law. It's the specter of a fifth column of vigilante justice, which includes beheadings, head choppings, and stoning. It's a specter that denies gender justice and equality. It's a specter which censures non-Muslims and forces them into converting. It's a specter of Sharia courts operating alongside British law where civil rights are denied to those who need them most. I have to be honest, this picture makes absolutely no sense to me. And it has never made any sense to me. I grew up in a, in a devout Muslim home. Uh, in our family, we prayed five times a day. We fasted during the, the month of Ramadan. My parents were both political activists, so our house, if you can imagine, in the late 70s and early 80s was filled with news of Iran and Palestine and Lebanon. We went out and marched when the Soviets invaded Afghanistan, when the massacres of Sabra and Shatila happened. I grew up in a very Muslim home, in a very political home, but I never once heard that my mission as a Muslim was to establish the Sharia in inverted commas. I was never once taught that this is what God had placed me on the earth to do. And that then raises the question for me now in this time and place where people are talking about Sharia in a way that I cannot even begin to fathom or understand. Let me take you back a little bit. What is it? What do we mean when we say Sharia? Well, there's a linguistic definition. There's a kind of a working definition. Linguistically, Sharia is often said to mean a path, a path to water, a path to sustenance. Linguistically, however, and the way it's terminologically rather used is that it means law. And when we say law, it probably means the vastest definition of law within an Islamic or Muslim frame that you can begin to imagine. Let me take you a step further. In any faith tradition, there's rules and regulations, things which shape our lives, cautions, um, ways in which we live, boundaries, acceptances, prohibitions. For Muslims, we believe that these boundaries and this framework of, for understanding the world is a way for us to connect ourselves with the divine. So there are things that we do and there are things that we don't do. Surprise, surprise, the things that we do are far outweigh the things that we don't do. Although some, once again, would have it otherwise. In terms of rules and regulations, these are things that are, of course, drawn from sacred text. For the Muslim, it's the Quran, which Muslims believe to be the revealed speech and word of God to the Prophet Muhammad upon whom be peace. But for us also, the sources of law are the statements and the sayings of the Prophet Muhammad himself. And it's to these that we look to for inspiration, for guidance, for morality and ethics. And indeed, it's what we look to for law. But here's where things for me get really interesting. If God had wanted to, I am sure that God could have given us the laws encoded, clarified, clear beyond a shadow of a doubt, laid down in absolutely simple and obvious ways. The fact is that God didn't do that. And so the Quran as a text is a text that is not just open to interpretation, that demands interpretation. The Quran as a book revealed in the Arabic language, is revealed in a language that is based on interpretation. For those of you who may be familiar with Arabic, you know that each word comes from a trilateral root. Each of those root words can be conjugated 
and transformed in upwards of 15 different ways. So the very language of the sacred text becomes incredibly dynamic. It becomes a text which demands us to read it, to reread it, to see it, not only within uh, the context of the time and place that is being revealed, but for all times and all places, if we indeed believe that the religion of Islam, as Muslims do, is a religion for all time and all place. Well, that says to me is that the whole process of deriving, codifying, understanding what God wants us to do is essentially a human endeavor. So this thing called Sharia that some of us, uh, that some people would like, to, uh, would like us to see as static, fixed, immutable, eternal, one, they are denied that ridiculous definition by the very idea and the very presence of the Quran itself, which is a book which demands us to, uh, to put endeavor and effort into understanding it. Of course, in the Quran, there are certain things which are totally obvious, certain rules and regulations which are clearly stated, upon which there's very little disagreement. But there are a whole range of other things which are not so clear. And that has really been the work of the last 1400 years of Muslim tradition. Let me explain further. When the Quran was being revealed, it was being revealed to a prophet who was living, alive, and living amongst people. When the prophet Muhammad was receiving revelation, he was enacting it through his own life, in his own context, to his companions, to the men and women who were around him. But a remarkable thing happens even during the prophet's life. And that is that as revelation comes down, and as the prophet teaches that revelation to his companions and his community, we already see the emergence of different points of view and opinions. There are a number of very famous cases in the life of the prophet where the companions, those who are closest to him, his disciples, the ones who accompany him, are disagreeing over revelation. The prophet is amongst them. So even during the prophet's life, the community is coming to terms with what revelation means and how they should apply it. What happens after the death of the Prophet Muhammad? Well, after the death of the Prophet Muhammad, we have a new source of, uh, of, of, of law, a new source text, which is the life and the sayings of the Prophet himself. So as we look to the Quran, we now look to his life and his sayings, which are collected and transmitted through an oral tradition and later written down, that now we begin to having to balance these two sources of texts. Well, we know that the Quran has 6,600 or so verses, it's eventually codified within a few years of the life of the Prophet into a closed corpus that we have with us today. But what about the sayings of the Prophet Muhammad? Well, when we look to the sayings of the Prophet Muhammad, there are hundreds and thousands of them, hundreds and thousands of narrations on how he lived, how he behaved, how he acted. How do we decipher that? Now comes the development of what we would call tradition. And through Muslim experience over the last 1400 years, Muslims have developed different schools of legal theory. In the Sunni, um, in, in the, in, amongst the Sunnis, who are one part of the, uh, of, of the Islamic family, you will find four major schools of law. Amongst our Shia brothers and sisters, you'll find two major schools of law. And beyond that, several others, all of whom have hundreds of thousands of scholars acting over hundreds of years of investigation, of building legal codices, building legal frameworks, building legal understandings in order to understand what God wants from us. Sharia is not a man sitting in the corner or a machine sitting in the corner that we, that we go up to and say, Sharia, tell me what I'm supposed to do. We press a button, ask a question, and all of a sudden something, something outputs. That's not the Sharia that I understand. The Sharia that I understand is a tradition, is a, is a corpus of human endeavor that has taken thousands of years of great sweat, blood, and tears, argument, making sense of things, deciphering things, making the faith practical. That's Sharia to me. And I think where we are at today, when there are calls from some Muslims about Sharia, I sometimes question whether they understand what they're talking about at all. 
and whether the rise of this kind of small extremist fringe, you see the Sharia as something fixed and not within the bounds of tradition as something that we should give credence to. I certainly feel as a Muslim, we shouldn't give credence to. And I think the greatest argument against them is the great tradition of Islam itself. And for me, as a Muslim, as someone who believes in the sacred texts of my faith, yet at the same time feel that I, as a Muslim in Britain or in Canada or elsewhere, am deeply engaged and rooted in the societies that I live in. And in fact, Sharia, as a, as a, as a way of understanding God's words, a way that informs the person I am, not in opposition to you, my friends, or to the others around us, but me as a fulfilled religious person, I see that as something incredibly powerful, and the Islamic tradition as something incredibly powerful. And I'll finish on this. When we talk about law, we have to also speak about something else. As Professor Sherman Jackson, a professor of religion at the University of Southern California writes, while law and theology are primary means through which Muslims gauge religiosity and pursue the public validation of feelings, belief, and actions, neither is immune to the subtle subtle machinations of of the self. The very act of engaging the law requires deep spirituality, a connection to God. And in Islam, the emblematic attribute of God is mercy, his benevolence, his greatness, his generosity, his gentleness, and God's justice. Justice, one of the great sages of Islam said, is required only in the absence of love. Love is able to do things that law is not able to do. We as Muslims and Christians, I think, can agree on that. What are the callers for Sharia calling for? I'm not sure they know. I'm not sure the right-wing pundits who want to raise the hackles of the specter of of the Muslim fifth column know either. What I do know is that they are both united in dividing and separating us from each other. Instead, what we need to do today is return to the richness of our traditions, to find in them solace for the soul, guidance for our lives, but more than that, a way of engaging and being with one another for the common good and for the mercy and to be agents of the mercy and generosity that I know God demands of us first and foremost above the law. Thank you very much.